what we know about miscarriages is that a lot of conceptions get lost before they reach clinical stage. And uh, that is even more so in a population that underwent IVF or infertility treatment, where you have even more uh, preclinical uh, losses. And I'm sure we are going to hear much more about that later on today. What we also know about miscarriages is that the, the risk of miscarriage is related to the maternal age. So we see uh, an increasing risk of miscarriage, especially when a woman is older than 35, and then the incidence of miscarriage rises steeply. So as uh, people tend to get uh, pregnant later on in life, nowadays we see a lot more miscarriages than we used to. What is also important is that the risk of miscarriages increases with the number of previous miscarriages. After one miscarriage, the risk that you miscarry is only 15%. After four mis miscarriages, it uh, is already 40%. So these are things that we also take in account when we uh, counsel patients for their prognosis in the early pregnancy unit. We look at early pregnancy with transvaginal ultrasound, and uh, this is what we see. At week four, we see a thicker endometrium in the uterus. We see a corpus luteum on the ovary, and then hopefully we will see the appearance of a, a small echogenic rim, and that is the trophoblast. At week five, the gestational sac will grow, and if you see a yolk sac in it, that's really reassuring because that confirms an intrauterine pregnancy. In the sixth week, you see the appearance of a fetal heartbeat, the embryo, and the embryo will grow, and the amniotic cavity enlarge, and the gestational sac will grow further. So this is what we see, and then uh, hopefully everything goes well. Sometimes we have to make the diagnosis of a miscarriage. We talk about recurrent miscarriage when you have two or three or more miscarriages, even if you have a history of a normal pregnancy or a live birth. Up to now, and to my knowledge, we also only talked about clinically observed pregnancies. So extrauterine pregnancies, uh, pregnancies of unknown location that failed, biochemical pregnancies were excluded from this definition. The miscarriages do not need to occur consecutively. And we also know that there are a number of risk factors for a recurrent miscarriage. So is the antiphospholipid syndrome, uh, cytogenetic uh, abnormalities, such as balanced translocations in one of the parents, and congenital uterine abnormalities uh, are sometimes cause of recurrent miscarriage, and uh, that was then also implemented in the basic uh, investigation guidelines that uh, were uh, published in 2006, and that are actually the guidelines that we use in Europe. When we do the basic investigations in a patient that has two or three miscarriages, we don't find anything in 50% of the patients. Um, so then you have no cause. Overall, you have then a good prognosis, and uh, in general, you have a chance of a successful pregnancy around 75% in the future, which is good. The only thing that is proven to be really beneficial then is tender loving care. And uh, patients have defined what they understand under tender love and care. And I uh, withheld a few things from that. Patient wants, patients want continuity in the follow-up. They want to be seen by the same person. They think a gynecologist is very important in the follow-up after recurrent miscarriages. And they want uh, regular ultrasound examinations. So they want, they want first a uh, follow-up with blood samples and HCG, and after that, when you can clinically see pregnancy, 
they want a follow-up with ultrasound. So this is what we do. In the past few years, there have been a lot of or a few um, papers that said that 50% uh, unexplained recurrent miscarriages, well, is not really true. If you look at embryonic karyotypes and you do examination of the miscarriage tissue, you find 30 to 50% abnormalities of the embryonic karyotype that can be a cause of a recurrent miscarriage. So that reduces the, the uh, amount of really unexplained recurrent miscarriages. And um, recent guidelines have also um, shifted a bit in that way that we used to do the guidelines according to the evidence levels which said that we should first do a karyotyping of the parents and a screening of antiphospholipid sy syndrome and so on. And then in 2011, there came this expert opinion guideline from the college that said that after two miscarriages in a third consecutive miscarriage, one should first do cytogenetic investigation of the embryo or the fetus, and then if you find unbalanced problems there, then you do a karyotyping of the parents. But that raises the question how you can get biopsies in these very early miscarriages. Remember the iceberg. And we also knew that when we do curatages or DNCs in early miscarriages, that the result is often 46XX. That means that the tissue, if you biopsy it, is highly contaminated. So, yeah, there was also an evolution in the uh, genetic investigation. It used to be uh, cumbersome and uh, uh, take a lot of time because you have to culture um, the uh, chromosomal material. Uh, and also in the recent years, there was a shift towards RACGH, which allows a complete examination in one single cell in a very uh, quick uh, way. So these two things led us to proceed to embryoscopy. I will quickly explain to you how we do it. So these are the instruments. We use a very short hysteroscope, rigid, but we, have a, uh, we need a biopsy and a working channel. We continuously irrigate with normal saline under a certain pressure throughout the procedure. Rarely we have to dilate the cervix because it's a miscarriage, so usually the cervix is open. You can open the uh, chorionic sac with micro scissors. I prefer to do it with the forceps. That makes the procedure easier, especially if you have to do it by yourself. We do this procedure under ultrasound uh, guidance. And as I said, I use the forceps. So, and this is, is a procedure that, that you have to do in different steps. First, you get into the cavity and you get a hysteroscopic view of the gestational sac. Then you will open the sac uh, with the forceps and you can see then the structures inside the sac, the little embryo or the yolk sac, as you see there. And then you can uh, take a biopsy either from the villi or the embryo. So we go through this again. Here you see the uh, chorionic sac that appears as a, an opaque sac inside of the cavity. You open it. I do it with the forceps. And then you wipe off the forceps so that you don't have any tissue from outside to get inside. You get inside the sac, first you see the chorionic villi, and then you can visualize the other structures, and you can look at the embryo. If you look at the embryo, of course you have to know what you have to look at and what is normal evolution. So we always compare it to the evolution as you can find on the website in the Carnegie uh, stages. And then you can have a look at that embryo and see on the right side that you have an abnormal uh, limb development for that stage. 
And here you also have facial defects like microcephaly. And these are things that are often uh, described in papers from experts that perform embryoscopy. There is also a classification for the very small embryos. And we'll not go uh, into that, but I think people doing embryoscopies it's uh, well useful if we all use the same language and the same classification. So you can find abnormalities in the limb developments uh, and other localized embryonic defects, um, head defects, umbilical cord defects, all that can be described. And I started these embryoscopies as a research project and of course, I wanted to find a syndrome or something like saying uh, trisomy 22 babies are always uh, always have limb defects or always have this or that. But that seems to be very difficult because um, yeah, actually the facial defects and the limb defects are the are the main thing that thing that you find. I just want to show you a small clip. If I can open this. No, I'm not able to open this. You want to see the clip? getting there. <laughs> yeah? Okay. So this is a, a clip of an embryoscopy. You can see, yeah, here it's already, it's not a small embryo, it's already a fetus around nine weeks. But you can see the retinal pigment and you can see the development of the hands. You can have a look around and see the back. The upper limb is al always more developed than the lower limbs, that's normal. Here you can see the structures quite well because the uh, fetus has generalized edema Yeah, you can see the ear. Here I'm moving this, you can see a physiological omphalocele, which is normal at that stage. And here I'm using a forceps to move uh, the embryo. When the embryo is much smaller, then, well, you have to turn off the water and try to visualize it very quickly because otherwise the water rinses it away very quickly. And okay. So this was the, the embryo. I hope you were able to see something. So, um, yeah, we do these embryoscopies in patients with recurrent miscarriage and uh, this is for instance a patient where uh, we had a fourth miscarriage, the patient was already 40 years old. We did an ultrasound at six weeks where we saw an embryo, as you can see on top, with uh, cardiac activity. Um, but there was already suspicion of a lot of vascularization of the placental tissue or the trophoblast. So the, the ultrasound was repeated at eight weeks in the regular follow-up. And at ultrasound, no embryo was seen anymore, but you could actually see that the vascularization of the trophoblast has, has become intenser. And then we looked at it with embryoscopy, and there we could find the embryo, as you can see on the left, the embryo attached to the yolk sac. And uh, you could see the chorionic villi. We took a biopsy, and it was a triploid uh, embryo and uh, the pathology result was that it was a partial 
more pregnancy. So in a preliminary series, um, we looked at what we found at these uh, embryoscopies and we found a lot of recurrent miscarriage specimen that showed uh, chromosomal aberrations, up to 70% actually. In the embryonic sac, where we took uh, biopsies, because you can also take biopsies when you don't see any embryo, you just take a biopsy within the sac, but in 90% of them we found chromosomal aberrations. We also found that in the group of morphologically normal embryos with an abnormal karyotype, in 60% it was trisomy 22. That has also been described by other people. And there are also cases in every paper on the topic where you have morphologically completely abnormal embryos but with a normal uh, karyotype. And therefore we are continuing our research that focuses on detection of lethal submicroscopic changes and we do this with array CGH. So this implementation of embryoscopy in our daily care of recurrent miscarriage patients has been uh, useful, I think. It's an operative technique which allows morphological examination and cytogenetic examination of the very small embryo. It also allows to take biopsies in animal embryonic sex and with a minimal risk of maternal contamination. And um, I also think it has its place in the care of patients who suffer from recurrent miscarriage. Uh, and they can even benefit from it, uh, although there is no actual cure for these genetic abnormalities. But patients with recurrent miscarriage want to know the cause of the miscarriage. And you can identify it with embry embryoscopy. Eventually, you will find an aneuploidy, and that would help the patient in coping further, especially elderly uh, patients really benefit from knowing if the cause of this miscarriage was an aneuploidy. And of course, we will continue to do research with it. Thank you. <laughs>